Der Herr Ganten hat es angesprochen, uh, It's the only choice, ist der Titel, Openness is the only choice, ist der Titel eines Videos, das wir uns jetzt gleich ansehen werden, von der äh, geschätzten Frau Brunswicker. Die Frau Brun Brunswicker ist äh, international geschätzte Expertin für Open and Digital Movements. Sie ist Professorin in, äh, in, an der Purdue University in den USA, aber auch Professorin in Australien. Und sie hätte, heute leider, sie hätte heute hier sein sollen, aber wie es halt so ist, äh, Krankheit verhindert dann doch die, die lange Reise über den großen Teich. Aber wir sind open und wir leben in einer digitalen Welt und insofern passt es eigentlich nur sehr gut, wenn wir hier ein, in, na, nicht interaktives, aber eine äh, entfernte, äh, ein Video von ihr, zur Verfügung gestellt bekommen haben, das sie extra für uns angefertigt haben, das wir uns jetzt anschauen können, mit der Präsentation, die sie hier gehalten hat. Sie hat das also in Windeseile erstellt und ich bin, ich habe schon Ausschnitte gesehen, ich bin sehr begeistert davon, Sie werden das jetzt auch sehen. Ich sage einfach mal Mats ab für die Frau Brunswicker. Brunswicker? Brunswicker? Brunswicker. Okay. Welcome Stuttgart. Good morning Stuttgart. Einen schönen guten Morgen Stuttgart. Es ist meine große Freude und Ehre, zur Open Conference 2016 den Einführungsvortrag halten zu dürfen. Und ich bin sehr traurig, dass ich nicht physisch vor Ort sein kann, da ich ja selbst eine ganze lange Zeit in Stuttgart gelebt habe und auch dort direkt in das Open Innovation Geschehen involviert war. Ich werde den Vortrag in Englisch halten, denn es ist ein internationales Thema, ein globales Thema. And that's why I'm going to switch to English now, because this presentation is going to be in English. Um, the objective of my talk is to give you an insight into the recent developments of open innovation, what we as scholars have been looking at, what we're um, excited about, we're raising new questions, at the same time also highlight highlighting the challenges and the opportunities related to openness in today's digital world. Usually I would have started this talk with asking you, have you heard of the term open innovation before you signed up for this conference? Unfortunately, I can't do that because I wouldn't um, get an immediate response. I'm just assuming that you all kind of know what open innovation is about, but just let's go back a little bit in time and When we started out getting really excited about open innovation in 2003, after a publication of a book titled Open Innovation, New Way of Profiting from Technology, we learned about all these really great case studies of companies like Procter Gamble, IBM, and then more and more also of German um, companies, successful companies, even the more uh, medium-sized ones like Bosch that experiment with various kinds of open innovation practices. And yet, it's a firm level concept that was discussed at that point of time where firms make use of knowledge from other actors, they work with universities, they work with their customers, etc., and take that knowledge to accelerate the innovation process or they find a new way to the market. And there's also examples of IBM in 2006, for example, decided to sell some of their patents um, or Uh, others deciding to freely re release or reveal some of their knowledge by participating in open source. Actually, a topic I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a few minutes. Well, over time, since 2003, there were also kind of concerned voices, negative voices saying, oh, that's just a fad, that's not really a phenomenon. Why should actually companies, firms give away their knowledge, make it available for free, or collaborate where there's always the risk of knowledge leakage involved? Well, because of that, Henry Chesper and I, Henry Chesper from UC Berkeley, often called also uh, one of the originators of the concept of open innovation, we performed a series of studies um, among large Uh, medium, um, large firms, particular large firms from the United States and Europe to see to which extent open innovation is actually practiced. And we move beyond just the measures that are usually used uh, in open innovation um, in the existing studies performed by the government 
where it's only about sources. And we've actually found several times over the last years that open innovation is a phenomenon. A large percentage of firms are practicing open innovation, more than 70%, close to 80%, as you can see here on that slide. Uh, only a small proportion actually decide to ban it once they've started it. They have increased their financial investment into open innovation and create new jobs. Now we have open innovation managers, partner managers, etc. Those jobs didn't exist a while ago. So it, apparently it matters, but what's also important is to point out that we see that they experiment with a variety of practice and they move from experimentation towards a more established way of deciding for which kind of problem should they choose which kind of open ocean practice. You know, this kind of picture, a bunch of flowers represents all the different open innovation practices. You might have heard of crowdsourcing, you might have heard of contests, communities, IP licensing, R&D partnerships, etc. In the end, you can actually nail it down or classify them in according to um, portfolio that I'm presenting in four types of modes. So on one axis, you see the degree and the number of actors involved in that. And on the other axis, you see the degree of knowledge sharing. And there we do have markets and partnerships, which are the more traditional bilateral ones. So market meaning, you know, you license a patent, you know, buy a technology, et cetera. And then the bilateral partnerships that have been around for a long time. And where you, but where you collaborate together and decide that you would jointly develop a solution. All uh, last year, there have been increasing, uh, increasing interest actually to move towards, I would say, more open approaches like contests, communities, collaborative crowdsourcing, and a contest where you invite a large number of external participants to develop a solution for your innovation problem. And they're competing and in a community and a collaborative crowd where there's collaboration happening where you jointly have the objective to develop um, an outcome, single outcome. Well, one example of how a company called Bombardier, you might know that, um, tried to uh, um, tackle a really, really difficult, as you can say, wicked problem in the area of urban mobility is Bombardier, where they invited a global crowd of civic innovators to solve um, the problem of a future in the city in the area of urban mobility. How are we going to um, commute if we have this increased population? Um, in the larger uh, metropolitan area. What kind of solutions concepts should we have in place? And that's a wicked problem because the solution is not something that's just a technical one, it's a social one and depends very much on the local needs, whether they have people, uh, whether people have preferences for walking, for driving, biking, etc. Um, their social context, where they feel comfortable in. And so we um, jointly, um, with actually collaboration of scholars also in Munich and an open innovation company in Munich, we actually went through that process with them. We designed that um, collaborative crowdsourcing initiative and made sure that through co-creation we can actually tame those wicked problems. And it was a success uh, from Bombardier point of view. They established themselves as a leader in an emerging topic in a mobility and if you want to learn more about that case uh, it's about to be published as well and you can find that also on our website. Well that was one trend that we've been seeing over the last year is a movement from bilateral interaction towards crowd and community-based interaction also the greater proficiency of the companies in making that happen and being able to manage a process. Second thing is that openness is not just something that matters at the firm level. Openness is also important when I'm thinking of communities, I'm thinking of platforms, I'm thinking of government, if you're thinking of open science. Unfortunately, I only have a limited time during this introduction, so I'm not going to talk about all these things in detail. I'm saying that in this context, openness matters. I'm going to point out a few things that we've been looking at recently and what I think is also an important trend that should be discussed today during your conference. One is communities. Communities, in particular open source software communities. I like that quote from an uh, investment uh, magazine uh, was, or it was an online uh, website where I found that you know, open source is eating the world. Oh, that sounds a little bit scary. Um, 
In the United States, we have an increased interest, increased investment of firms, corporate firms that in the end want to make money, you know, interested in financial gains, in open source where the actors contributing actually agree to make the technology available for free. There's no way to, um, in a sense, develop a patent or a protection around that. So we have, in a sense, a new uh, industrial model of open source software, which is different from the original model of open source software. I'm going to put on this red hat right now because I'm very proud of my Fedora hat. Um, kind of um, a symbol, I would say, of um, open source, um, where individuals um, agreed to make their artifacts, their technology and source code available for others to use. And that we're actually against, uh, fighting against the original thinking of, you know, walling off or developing a pattern around that. Now we have open source software communities where we also have firms, not just investing, not just donating, but actually having the employees code and contribute. And you found in various domains on that slide, I give you a few, uh, lots of, you know, examples of um, open source software communities. I'm going to just uh, talk a little bit about OpenStack because one of my, um, research team members is also um, working on OpenStack. It's basically a cloud computing um, community in that community. We do have, interestingly, those different actors. So we do have the vendors that, like for example, Red Hat, VMware, et cetera, um, have employees that contribute code, participate in the communities. And the second thing is also you have the actual individuals, the original hackers, the independent users that participate in that. And at the end, you also have firm users, corporations that use open source software. So they're not just there working with the vendors, they're actually in the community. They're actually contributing to the community. They're committing, they're coding. So it's kind of interesting because among the different vendors, there is definitely some competitive spirit happening. So then the individuals that work for those different companies in the end have them to agree that they collaborate and follow the objectives of the community. So that creates a tension. Well, then the question is, you know, giving the, these potential tensions of collaboration, is there actually joint problem solving happening? What I mean by joint problem solving is if there is a new feature that is posted by a contributor, are they then actually allocating their resources, their people to that and solving the other features or let's say implementing coding um, the actual solution for that? Or is it more like an asylum that you see in a picture where they're just, you know, everybody does the thing they want, they just work on the features they're interested in? Well, uh, this is just, you know, um, visualization of the um, joint problems or activities and you see on, uh, of that over time this, um, that there is definitely joint problem solving happening overall in the community. But the second plot on that slide, that shows it only among the distributors, the vendors, and there you basically see such a little contribution happening. Well, let's conclude just based on some of our study is we do have little joint problem solving among the different vendors. It's actually relatively closed. Only when it comes to features or uh, products that are, um, let's say, proposed by the customers, then there's joint problem solving, which is definitely a good thing because we see that open source is moving something that's just triggered by the tech companies or by tech, sorry, by technologists or thinkers actually by the end here. So I hope you're not falling asleep right now. So you're still with me in this particular context. This is not a bad thing. When the end, we also have to think, you know, is, is such a basically closeness inside an open community um, a good thing? Does that potentially also create some instabilities and so on? So we need to think of how are we actually, you know, and working as an individual in these communities that in the end develop something that has corporate interests. We can't control that because in the end, those individuals follow the logic of the community. So there's this internal tension. Am I an employee of a company or am I basically one who's working in the community? So that's something where the future of work is quite different. And this quote here that I'm showing you from a vice president of um, a senior executive um, in a tech company um, really clarifies that. You know, I think we mastered a lot of challenges in open innovation. However, Working 
with inside and communicating with open source software communities is still a big, big challenge. And then this uh, chart also shows that from a corporate firm perspective, it's quite difficult um, to align with, um, with the thinking of freely willing, giving away for free, because I'm happy to take in sight for free, you know, and you, et cetera. But when it's about giving away, then there is less willingness to do so. So an important thing for discussion later on, I hope that you might talk about a little bit about this tension of you know, sharing and protection in very open forms of developing code, developing software, but also not uh, other products. Since we you know, move towards open hardware, or if you think of Wikipedia, et cetera, will we actually do the same thing? So um, talk a little bit about communities and new um, era of communities, industrial communities, and I'll talk about platforms. I'm pretty sure that everybody here uh, at the conference is using some form of a platform. Um, you have a smartphone, which in the end is a platform because it connects those that develops the app with you as an end user. So they move from value creation, it's like I have a product to sell, to we, a platform, having different sites. Um, so here, same thing in terms of how do we actually attract developers that create the apps that I need. It's not something you can control. It's not like a supplier contract. So what are they doing? Now let's face this, in the end, it's really that develop resources for the developer, developers, make them available. We call them software development kits, um, libraries, subroutines, etc. They make it easier for the developers to develop an application for that, and give guidelines, etc. to um, um, have better applications on the platform. So that's one way to design the platform. And here again, there's different degrees of openness. Some go that far that they really make it open source. Others basically are very rigid and have more, uh, have limited access to that. But there's another dimension also of the design of openness of the platform, which is how do I design the information, the behavioral information, the social information about what others are doing on that platform. Here's just a um, chart of the rankings of the top uh, apps on iOS. So now if you were a developer, if you're a developer company and you're on rank 500, you know, develop kind of a competitive sphere, I hope so, or you would compare yourself with those others and you then take action. Because we all as an individuals, we do have to some extent aspiration and we compare ourselves. We influence by our envi environment. That also applies to some extent in a corporate context, but in particular, the more the individual matters, the more the social aspect comes into play. So we do have information that actually shapes what we do. So we compare ourselves to us on a platform. We have access to certain information on a platform. Well, we actually ran some studies on that and we can see that what kind of information is shared and how individuals respond to that information can actually have positive and negative effects. So without going to detail in, on the work that we're doing here, is we see that the, depending on the information that is accessible and depending on the behavioral response of people to that, we can create inequalities. So if you're on this, there's an illustrative chart where you have performance on the one hand and then um, you see um, then the diff the, it's a distribution chart, but you see that only a few that make it to the top, the second one is actually at the lower end because we have created inequalities in the way the information was shared and be because of the differences and in how individuals respond to that. So now think of what happened with Brexit. Now think of what happened with the election. We, we, I think you all saw it in the news as well. I mean, the way information, we, the, what we look at Facebook, etc., cetera, that um, creates our opinions, that creates a certain assumptions and that also triggers certain behaviors. So in a world of open pl platforms, there's a positive side of that. There is the ability to create new things on top of a platform, but there's also to some extent uh, negative implication in a sense, you could say, because what you actually provide, the information that you provide, the environments that you provide shapes a behaviors that might not always be beneficial. So we need to think of also as policymakers, we have to think of our platform designers, how can we overcome those kind of tension? The last thing that I'm going to talk about, because I know running out of time is open data and open government. 
um, because they are also the, the design of the environments in which open data are turned into open data innovations, as I call them, matters a lot. And I'm sure everybody of you is using or has been using some form of an open data application. Like one of the old examples was the Weather Channel, because without open data, the Weather Channel wouldn't be possible. But today, we do have quite different open data opportunities, I would say, because we have governments around the world suggesting or asking or even requiring the agencies and the states and the regions, the cities, etc., to release governmental data in various areas, culture, energy, healthcare, education, etc. And they are also machine readable or they are standardized in terms of format, which makes it easier then for creative people to turn this data into something valuable. And I have here a screenshot, for example, of a mashup, a web application, where someone has used data about alternative fuel um, opportunities in, uh, in the United States, and you can explore where you would find alternative fuel links and um, you can use that information to make a decision on that or just get an overview of it, but actually make use that in an actionable way. Well, when I look at the way right now governments are trying to incentivize developers to make use of this data because they're interested in, in having open data developments happening, then it happens via contest. So now think contest. Contest means competition. Contests are usually designed in a way that you don't see what the other is doing because you, you think of that would you know, ruin the whole idea of a contest because if I see what the other is doing, others are doing, you know, I might just copy that, right? So they're not following the idea of what I say transparency for reuse, which um, is different from thinking of a greenfield application. But recently also open data um, practitioners or catalysts, I call them, have pointed out that open data is not just about greenfield application. It's really about augmentation, building upon prior knowledge, you know, increasing what's out there, improving it, remixing it, etc. And that's actually very much in line with what we've been talking about innovation for a long time, that innovation is not something that falls off the sky. Innovation is something that's a recombination of things and usually has some typical elements and then some atypical ones. So there's on the one hand the idea, you know, you know, open data contests should be designed in the way that they foster reuse because reuse is important to drive the innovation performance and the productivity of individuals. And on the other hand, there's also this negative thinking saying, so, you know, if there is a transparency in the contest, because everybody's just going to try to develop a solution that, um, that others have been developed, just you know, follow the others hurting, etc., or um, copy from the best if they have access to the best performing information. That might not necessarily lead to greater innovation performance. Well, we have been uh, here in some NSF supported studies, been experimenting with this idea. And instead of just having a contest where there's a final submission in the end, you do have different iterations. So here's your kind of a process chart. You have different hacking phases. You have different open data innovation activities. And during each of these activities, um, the developers turns open data into an application and then submits it. And after the submission, they will get feedback. They'll get um, expert input. But at the same time, they would also have the opportunity to see other solutions to use others' ideas, use other solutions, and recombine that. There's been a platform and a technology developed for that, and that's just a screenshot um, of that platform. So you see here the different hackers having access to other solutions, their scores, but they can also click on the GitHub. They can also click on the project links and see the running application. There's, it's all automated. We have some analytics on that as well. And we've been trying to see what kind of environment, what kind of um, context, technological context, what kind of analytics, um, what kind of smart environment can make our hackers actually better and smarter. And we found a few trigger reuse. If you have transparency, we actually 
can increase innovation performance. I'm go not going to into detail. Again, this study is also available on our website. But um, my point is that when it comes to open data and when it comes to using context, transparency is not a bad thing. Transparency can trigger reuse in a positive way. Here you see one of the applications that has been developed by some of our developers in the context. It's an application that is a focus on the challenge, how can I find a safe place to rent in the area of Lafayette? because indeed we also do have areas here at Purdue that aren't that safe. And he meshed up seven different data sets. Um, he had really great visualization features in there. I'm not able to show you the actual interactive um, application at that point of time, would love to do. But in the end, this is one of the outcomes of a transparent open data contest. Uh, we're scaling this now, we're running virtual hackathons to learn more about it, to develop better applications, but on the other hand also, to, and that's what I'm going to show you next slide, to also bring the thinking in terms of open data, open access, into the curriculum so that students, when they work on a project, in a capstone project, for example, that they're not trained in a way that they only think of protecting what they do and walling it off from others, but that they're already think of reuse of openness, etc. because openness and transparency and reuse can actually improve the innovation performance. Purdue Iron Hacks, as we call it, because we call it Iron Hacks with the different faces of hacking, it's not just one time thing, has become part of classes and uh, hopefully will also become um, part of more classes in the future at Purdue, outside of Purdue, etc. As you can see, we have partners involved in that as well that support us in that. I'm at the end of my presentation. I could go on for and talk in more detail about the different studies we have been working on. There are two kind of um, important aspects at the end that I want to point out. When it comes to openness, when it comes to openness and innovation in the digital age, we need to think of ecosystems, different actors with different objectives that try throughout the life cycle from the initial idea from the release of an open data on you know, throughout the continuous use of an application, right, et cetera. What about co-creation? Co-creation is hard because it implies that we have to overcome the tension between competition, collaboration, knowledge sharing, and protection, and stability and change. But the infrastructures that we put in place for that can support that. And that means that we have infrastructures that have the technologies, that have the affordances and the features, et cetera, to make that happen. To also support to some extent on so protection and sharing. And API is a very good example because it you know, gives an ability to say, you know, this is what I'm going to protect and this is what I'm going to share. And to make that happen also in the, in the academic disciplines around that, we need to think more about how we're basically supporting that and also how are we collaborating so it's not just about one particular discipline tackling the phenomenon of open and digital innovation. We need to work people with a uh, background in the social science and the management and innovation, people with a background in, in com computer science, statistics, data science, et cetera, and, and then also information technology and engineering, et cetera, uh, to develop new approaches, new theories, but also new tools, new platforms that help us to thrive in an open innovation landscape. And in the end, there's a very often a behavioral question also involved in that. And that was also something I talked a little bit about in my um, introductory keynote. I conclude with that. And thank you for your attention. And I wish you a wonderful day today. And I hope that my thoughts have inspired the following pan panel discussions. Thank you.